So I am very lucky to have today to have as my um, guest on Grill Country, Jordan Daniel Wood, um, who is a theologian and a proud father. <laughs> and he has written a book on um, the on on Maximus the Confessor's uh, um, theology. It's called "The Whole Mystery of Christ," with the subtitle "Creation as Incarnation and Maximus the Confessor." So I just kind of the first question I wanted to ask you, Jordan, is like, what's tell tell me a little bit about your background. It's like, how did you how did you end up coming to study Maximus, write this book? What 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 captured your attention how, what, how is the whole journey to you becoming the kind of person who wants to study maximus and write a write write a book like this yeah sure <clears throat> thanks again for having me on um oh, it's so it's uh well i guess yeah i have told this story another time but basically so uh, my, my background broadly is that i was raised in a, a protestant tradition that that was like very uh, I'm not sure what to call it, biblicist, sort of restorationist in its impulse. So a lot of focus on the text of scripture, on the original languages, um, and then kind of a uh, an open uh, take on everything else that happened after the, the New Testament. And, and, the, and so, which, which I, I, I was grateful for, I was trained in that, I went and actually my undergrad was in uh, one of their schools, and uh, it really made me attentive to the text of scripture and appreciated of it. So that, that's something I've always loved about my background. Um, it also, <laughs> I think somewhat unintentionally, it sort of primed me, I think, for being able to entertain some wild ideas. <laughs> because if you're told like growing up, like, um, you know, like God placed the fossils in the world to look old to test your faith in Genesis, then like you're kind of used to stretching the <laughs> the uh, bounds of the possible. So, but I think you can you can you know, you can make that turn that for good use and, and sort of imagine sort of good you know good to kind of uh, try more more beautiful visions uh, of things. So I I was raised in that tradition and but as I was studying scripture at the at the school as one does they get questions and started asking questions about the things I'm being taught, how I'm being taught to read it. I catch wind that there's this figure called Origen who had interpreted scripture quite differently than the way I was being taught to. And it was sort of presented in a negative light, but that actually just intrigued me. So, so I started hunting down Origen and why he thought he could handle scripture the way he did figuratively, spiritually, allegorically. And so I that, that was my doorway into the what you might call the greater Christian tradition. And so I, I went on and did a master's in and wrote a thesis on origin, really with that question, uh, how does he justify reading scripture the way he does? And then um, from there, I spent some time in France and my wife and I did. And then, yeah, we, we, we went to Boston. I went to Boston College for my doctoral de degree. And I was probably going to write on, by this time I was kind of, I was very into St. Gregory of Nyssa. I wanted to do Greek patristic stuff because biographically that had been important for me in a lot of my childhood tradition to kind of unlock for me other ways of thinking. And so I was like, well, I'm going to stick with this guy. I really like him a lot. Um, I had read David Hart's, you know, Beauty of the Infinite. Obviously he makes Nyssa a big deal there. So anyway, I was like, yeah, you know, this seems like a good person to, to spend time with. I very much viewed my doctoral um, studies as a formation, like an apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to find, that's why I did historical, I wanted to find someone that I considered a sort of theological master, apprentice myself to his or her thought, and try to kind of, as it were, master the system, <laughs> or at least get a, a feel for it, and, and see how they worked in all arenas and in, in many different, across many different themes, Topoi. And so, uh, well, when I was going into the person I wanted to study with, he was more in the fourth century. He was a scholar of the fourth century. He was actually on his way out. I didn't even know it. We didn't even like overlap a year. He was gone by the time I arrived. So I'm looking around, trying to find a class to take, and I just see <laughs> in uh, at, uh, Holy Cross, uh, Hellenic Holy Cross up in Boston that they're and we we're connected to them, and I could take a course on Maximus. So he was offering, and it was Father Maximus Constus who was the translator of the ambigua and the uh, questions of Thalassius. And so he was teaching a course on the ambigua. I was like, well, whatever, you know, I've read a little Maximus. He seems interesting. So it really was just, I always say it's, it's basically within three weeks, 
I was smitten, you know, it was mm. like, mm. what in the world? We're reading Ambiguum 7, and there's this stuff about the Logos is the Logi, and we're all portions of God fallen down from above, so according to St. Gregory of Azienzis, and Maximus interprets that, and it's this wild and amazing and perplexing kind of vision he unravels or he paints. And so I just knew then, I was like, man, this guy, there is something here. I want to spend time here. I want to understand how he's saying what he's saying and like whether he means some of this stuff. And the Ambiguum 7 is, you know, has contains the passage around which my whole book is focused or, or source worlds, which is that Ambiguum 722, that the word of God, very God, wills always and in all things to actualize the mystery of his incarnation. That was like, that's the sort of big picture there in one statement. And so I really, I was struck by that immediately. And I was just like, wait, what? The mystery of his incarnation always and in all things? Is that serious? Is that really what this whole thing is? And so that's when I just decided to kind of stick with Maximus. Ended up writing a dissertation on him. Were, you, vi- yeah. were you still like, were you still attached to your original tradition at the time that you're doing this? Just to, or are you already so... Yeah, so it was it was very loosened by that point. I mean, okay, because I can just I can't imagine like a a fundamentalist coming would would have no idea what to. Yeah, it was it was like yeah, and and that so origin has sort of already got you know done a number on me, right? Uh, But I was still in that tradition even while I was studying him. Then I went away. My wife and I went away to France for a year, and we just did language school. We went to we wanted to learn French as well as we could in a year. And so while we were there, it was kind of like an, you know, an opportunity to just sort of see what was around. So we started attending a lot of just basically mostly empty for, you know, French mass is Catholic mass. Mm. I did a little bit of Latin mass. I did, I don't know. I was just sort of, it was, it was interesting. There was a really nice cathedral where we are in Orléans that was that hardly anyone went to, but we went there. We had some friends actually from it. India that were seminarians. We, I didn't realize that until a little later. So we started to go into their seminary uh, for mass and stuff. So it was already, we were kind of, uh, I'm Catholic now. So I was already sort of, my wife was raised Catholic. So for her, it wasn't so, okay. it was just sort of returning to her, her mm-hmm. roots. And um, did that play a factor in you? Like, cause you were studying patristics, right? So you could like, yeah. maybe you could have gone Orthodox, but you ended up going Catholic. Was your wife's yeah. connection to that? Was that part of the factor there? That was a part of it for sure. Um, and then really that year in France was sort of enchanting. I, I don't know. It was a, I always refer to it as like okay. our dream. <laughs> it was, it yeah, felt like yeah, a yeah, dream. Yeah. Sure. It felt like it, we were like in a French choir. We were like in a, a, a play. We we were doing acting and it was just crazy. So ultimately you're a man <laughs> of the West and you felt it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I was it. like, you know, this is pro- proximate wise now. However, I have, having said that, as is probably obvious from, from my who I study and who I write about typically, it has simultaneously been the case that the East has, for me personally, always been the source, the vital source. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that that isn't a judgment about any, anything else. And I, I've read lots of St. Augustine, I've read St. Thomas, I've read, I've had two courses and all these, and I'm, and I like, I like a lot of that. I love Augustine's Confessions as much as anyone else does, or De Trinitate or any of that. But I don't know, it was always, you know, I say the East, I'm obviously I'm speaking pretty broadly, but I, even like my early 20s, I had caught wind that Rowan Williams had, he said at one one interview, he read all of Dostoevsky when he was like in his 20s. So I was like, that's a good idea. I'm going to do that. <laughs> so I did. And like that was, and I, that really, it was very impactful uh, for me at the time. And then, of course, Origin is sort of bringing me along on this intellectual journey right out of where I came from. So he's 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 the guy there. And by the time I get to Boston College and I'm finding Maximus, he's he's becoming for me sort of this the great synthesizer of everything creative, just amazing kind of genius. And and so all along the way, Bogakov has is, is, is become more important for me in the last three to five years. So all these figures have, have kind of Berdayev was really influential on me. Uh, Nikolai Berdayev. And so it, I've had that, you know, probably has resonates with you from from what I know of you, but like you're in the you're in the I'm in the west. west but I read all the same stuff yeah exactly I read yeah and it's and it's like there's that kind of Anglican thing in the yeah. background too yep. where it's yeah, like, and I'm an Anglican of, so right so it's go. like all this so I you know 
and so even to this day it's like i've got friends that have become eastern catholic and that doesn't practically work for me right now i could see myself though if it was like you know, i got four kids and if there was a parish life that was was viable on a day a, a weekly basis it probably would become i i, I yeah, I probably would become Eastern Catholic pretty easily. My friend Michael Martin, who's often on the podcast, he's that's he's he's Byzantine Catholic, so he's, he's yeah. Byzantine, right? Yes, so, yeah, yeah. And yeah, right into the Divine Liturgy. All that stuff has been uh, it's just like like all things being equal, I prefer that, and and I would mm. I would I would do that. It's just that it just so happens right now we're in a position where Roman Catholic is works for us and, and where we are community, our kids' school, etc. So. So that's where I'm at. But I also want to say this. This is kind of a just a little bit of a side point. You know, there is a part of me. I don't want to make myself a hero because I'm not. <laughs> but there is a part of me, too, that's like, you know, that shouldn't be weird, though. Like, like there's a little bit of a wager here. And maybe it's maybe it's maybe I'm making it ad hoc. But there's this there is a sense, though, that I've come to, to be like, you know, it shouldn't really matter if I'm a Roman Catholic like St. Maximus is in my church as, as a saint too, <laughs> you know, like St. Gregory of Nyssa is a saint in my church too, like this isn't, and so of course there are differences and stuff, and I don't want to minimize those, but like there is a part of me that's like, you know, the wager is the, 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 the true body of Christ is eschatological, and it's going to be the reintegration of all members, you know, and some of the stuff I got from Balthazar, he was important for me uh, at a certain moment, he still is, um, and you know, it's, it's the treasures have been divided, and and we're actually all the poorer all, all of us for it and so there's a, there's a part of me that's like you know um, if you can't bring yourself wherever you happen to be for whatever reason if you can't bring yourself to lean into the ecclesi your ecclesial identity as the eschatological body of christ mm -hmm. then i'm not really sure what we're doing and um yeah, so I was inspired by Balthazar. I like like uh, Robert Jensen's a figure I like. I'm not I've never been Lutheran. My mom was raised Lutheran, but um, but you know he begins his systematic theology in a similar thing. He's like, I write this I write this book for the eschatological church, the one and only true church. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's obviously people could quibble with this and that, but but I do think at the very least that ought to be our orientation. So there's a part of me that's like it is factually like descriptively kind of interesting or a juxtaposition to be you know going to a novus ordo roman catholic sort of suburban suburban parish but studying and reading all these figures from various parts of especially eastern christian tradition and studying them you know as, as much as i can seriously as i can but at the same time you know catholic like small c catholic like universal like this isn't actually strange right, right? at the end of the day we all are rich which, are each which is a nice transition point to talk about the <laughs> it's about yeah. primary argument of your book. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so in a nutshell, and it will be a nutshell, um, as I said, I kind of organize it uh, around that that statement, the uh, the kind of main epigraph of the book, Invigium 7, 22, Maximus declares that the word of God, a, a very God, wills always and in all things to actualize the mystery of his incarnation. And so the rhetorical framing of the book, which I don't think is just rhetorical, but I thought it would be helpful. And there's a little tongue in cheek there, but not much, to be honest, is that that statement and similar other statements from Maximus. We could have gone elsewhere. Like the title of the book comes from question 60, question to Lossius, where it says in Christ. Um, and, and in fact, the whole mystery of Christ is how they usually translate it. In Christ, the whole mystery of Christ, all of the ages and all of the beings within those ages have received their beginning and their end. And the reference is the historical event. You know, it's not just, it's not some kind of abstract idea. It's like in the actual event, in the middle of history, everything receives its not just its end, like he finally lived up to what we're called to as as the new and true Adam, but it's um it's they've even received their principle. They're our key. Like everything was always flowing forth from this event, the identity of time and eternity in time, uh, both in all directions temporally. And it's all culminating there too, in some way. I mean, after all, Paul says the end of the ages has already come upon us, right? So, uh, and Peter says that too. So, so, uh, so we could have gone there, that statement. We could, we could do the big game stuff. We could go there, go all these other statements that I pretty we catalog and discuss at some detail throughout the book. 
the rhetorical framing of the book is like, does he really mean this? <laughs> like that's a that's a bold thing to say. Or is it kind of more, as one writer put it, like a hyperbolic, the sort of doxological hyperbole, or you know, it's sort of like he's getting carried away. It's a nice way of describing, it's a nice image. You know, Christ incarnate in all things. This is we've heard this before in other places, like uh, not least of which is the New Testament, like Colossians 3:11, which says that explicitly. Um, so, so I, I just kind of noticed that when people ran into these kinds of statements in Maximus's thought, which did push the boundaries in a lot of ways, or at least according to a lot of systems, they would explicitly sometimes, or, or more often, you know, implicitly qualify that away, mollify the edges a little bit, right? And say, well, like a few writers actually say, this is a metaphor. This is a metaphor. And they just mean by that, like, you know, a symbol in a flat sense. I know there's other ways you could say that. But. Do you think the impulse to do that was primarily theological or philosophical? Like, what I, was that? I think it's both. I think okay. it's a good question. And I do think it depends on, you know, people have different reasons to do it. Um, sometimes it's philosophical in the sense of, um, well, well, I suppose this is both at once, right? It's, it's a kind of, you know, like one of the things Maximus says uh, is, so he would be categorized in, if you want to put it in theological jargon, like a super lapsarian Christology, which means, or you might put it in a different, you'd say he, he's a part of the incarnation anyway crowd, which, which is to say that the incarnation, unlike certain parts of the tradition, which imagines the incarnation is simply a response to the fall that perhaps wouldn't have happened at all had, had Adam not sinned. Um, Maximus pretty clearly thinks that, I mean, he says it explicitly that the incarnation was that for the sake of which there is nothing greater. It is the ultimate purpose. He says, this is the purpose for which all things were made. This is the end towards which all things is moving. This is the ground and goal of creation, right? The, the incarnation, the hypostatic identity of created and created nature in the word of God. So, um, so um, I bring that up because if you take that, really seriously from certain people's perspectives they would say well hold on a second does that mean like creation in the world is like as eternal as god like like if the word of god is the goal the beginning and end of creation does that mean that what the word is the eternal man is he eternal god man is he eternally incarnated like what are we you know and there's other debates and people and so some people that are worried about that they're worried about bringing god and the world too closely together in intimate relation and God needs to be transcendent. And sometimes there's a, there's a, um, that, that's a theological, you know, it can become an explicitly theological worry. Like, well, what, like God is impassable, for example. So are, what are we, are we, are we putting the passion of Christ right in the center of the Trinity from eternity? So that's a problem from that perspective. So I think there's sometimes like that kind of stuff lurking. Other times it's more philosophical, like the fear of Hegel or of idealism. Because as Balthazar even said in 1939, he called Maximus in a letter, the, the, the Hegel of the Greek fathers, by which he meant there's such an intimate link often in Maximus's thought between God and the world and Christ, that it's almost like they're mutually implicative. You know, they're, they're almost, you can't have one without the other, which seems to compromise the transcendence of God. I think sometimes it can also become political. That's another thing that isn't as clear, like, like uh, there's a sort of narrative and I think a sort of easy narrative of maybe too easy narrative, narrative of modernity broadly put that says, you know, in modernity, we've immanentized the, yes, the um, transcendent, we've rid everything of enchantment, we've collapsed God into the world and the world processes and the historical unfolding and there's process theologies, et cetera. And that kind of acts as a fundamental justification for all that is new in secularity, all innovation, all new thoughts, because after all, it's this unnecessary unfolding dialectical process in history or something like that. And that can become a sort of just a, a carte blanche justification for progressivism or something, right? 
So that I think is that's a that's me reading a little bit into the lines, admittedly. <laughs> Nobody really explicitly says that, but sometimes I do get that sense, right? That one reason why we want to protect God from the world, like and then intermingling too closely, is that if if you don't, then all of a sudden you're gonna get a world which is nothing other than the perpetual. Yeah, it makes it harder to have a strictly hierarchical view of reality. Yes, right. Yeah, so, and so so hence it, the it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so H hence the fear of hegel of idealism of secularity of modernity it's all kind of wrapped up and you can put it in theological terms like you know well we want to protect god's society or vastability um but you very often you're worried but, about but then how do we how do we explain david bitley hart's problem with you who obviously has no problem with the god world relationship being 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 close and and is a christian anarchist by my understanding although the way he expresses himself is very different from the way i do you know i would also consider myself christian anarchist what's what's the what's the root of his of his being if you don't mind addressing that. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be a, I'll be a, uh, David and I are, we're friends. I mean, we, yeah, I, I, I know it's, it's so weirdest thing. It's like, I'm reading him. I'm reading your name and the acknowledgements <sighs> to your gods. Right. And then and like then two weeks later, mind. it's like, what, what happened? Yeah. Well, and that's the funny thing. And like, in, in, you know, where David and I, you know, we, we have to, we've reminded each other on more than one occasion where we're like, you know, whatever our differences are in the details, and there's some daylight between us on certain things. If you, we're far, we're far closer to each other in many, many, many ways than we, than either of us are to many other major trends of theology today. And so, that that being said, um, I almost think sometimes, you know, and I've told David I want to write up a kind of conciliatory piece. That, uh, you know, he's 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 sort of said things before that make it sound like we're just so completely different. I, I don't really think that's true. I think um, I think almost sometimes our, our disagreements comes in like the best way to execute uh, or like a strategic you know, sort of way of executing towards the same end. So I won't, I mean, you, you probably have noticed from the book, I, I think it's less useful to just sort of without a whole lot of uh, qualification come out and say like, well, by nature, we are gods. Um, like it's like it's a part as if what what's meant there is um, we are we have the natural capacity qua human to become God. Now I there is a sense in which I agree, you know um, that that uh, from birth, like the the more original sense of by nature, natos is birth. From birth, we do have within us the potency to become God, but because what's within us is the word of God, not because it's sort of part of our natural perfections as nature, uh, like, like as essence almost is what I mean here, like as abstract form, right? And, and that you can't really take a Maximian view and think otherwise because he's so clear that the logos of nature or essence is never alterable. And that tinkering with one into the other would, as, as David opens his book, You Are Gods, it would be like a rabbit becoming a deer or an angel. It would obliterate one for the sake of the other species. Now, I don't actually always think David means that. I think, I think often he, and this would be a part of my conciliatory proposal that I've mentioned to him, I think sometimes he means something more like what an idealist means by spirit. Mm. Or, or what you might, or what actually Bulgakov sometimes means by person which is the unity, he, the unity of individual with nature as a concrete determinate spirit, self-conscious. That, that is more like, uh, that's closer to an idealist view of spirit for one thing, but it's also closer to what I kind of think the neo Castilians and Maximus in particular means by an actual person. An actual person, is, he's already assuming is already all those unities. And, and of course there is no person, there's no human person or rational entity from my perspective, either that doesn't have the logos himself as the very foundation of the personhood that yeah, you and are. Yeah, it's, it's kind of it. person that a lot of his vitriol has been directed at, which is interesting. I, this is per, this was I found this very ironic because it was actually what David wrote about person in Doors of the Sea that mm. kept me from like kind of going down an Eastern non-dualist path. So. Right. But and the way he's talking about person now is if like it's a it's a vacuous, empty concept yeah. doesn't match the David who was writing what he wrote about person and doors of the sea. So there's there's some kind of disconnect there where it's just like 
I, I don't know. It's just, it seems to be like overly caught up in, in maybe the specifics of the idiom. Yeah. And I think there's a, there's certain, um, let's say um, bogeyman he's trying to avoid like, like in that, it, this is, this is again, another funny moment of, of like uh, where we're sort of swirling around each other and, and, and it's not always predictable where we're going because it was a 19th century Catholic anti-idealist trope to equate person with will like voluntaristic will right because that was the that was the answer to the dragon seed of hegelian pantheism instead right. of having this determinate dialectic just sort of impersonally and mindlessly working itself out through the through the vagaries of history you want to assert a god who is personal by personal you mean free total brute will utterly right right utterly right. indifferent right could could have done without the world altogether it certainly doesn't need to be mucked up in the mire of history none of that and that that's what it meant to be a person there was at root there was also a kantian idea of spontaneity and that was a catholic like franz anton stadmeier is an example he was writing against hegel he's gonna he's gonna talk like that about person all the time and then you move to the 20th century, you have certain strands that sometimes consciously, but not always, they're picking up similar, um, you know, volunteers, whether it's, it doesn't have to be French existentialism of like Sartre, but it could also be like, um, you know, certain Greek thinkers, I know, Yanaras or uh, um, parts of Zizoulas, even though he kind of shifts on uh, over the course of things. But, you know, where where I think sometimes, sometimes David seems to me to be afraid uh, that foregrounding the person just foregrounds the will. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I, I, I think that is this fear. And I was actually just I was just reading rereading uh, before I talked to you today. I was reading uh, Jesse Hake's uh, summary of of the dispute, and one of the paragraphs in there caught me. And, and it was David's it was David's definition of faith that got my attention. It's like, oh, for David, faith is really just a rational proposition, ultimately. So. Mm -hmm. He's he's thinking about person from the standpoint of willing and not talk not thinking about person from the standpoint of knowing. Right. So yeah. if you understand faith as to be a kind of knowing that is like the knowing of a person instead of the knowing of a proposition, right, then you're you're not really as concerned about this idea of a person that just reduces it to willing. Because that's not right. really a person isn't reducible to merely willing. Right, exactly. And there's well, yeah. an and and knowing a person is 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 definitely it's something that's ineffable. Like you can't really yeah. fully know. Right, you can't fully know. You can't capture it in a concept, an idea, a formula, a definition. Yeah. Um, yet, yeah, exactly. Willing is a faculty. It's a mode by which a person actually acts, wills, desires, like determinate things. Yes, under I agree with him under the infinite horizon of our desire, which is always towards God. However, that horizon is also determinate. It's the Trinity, right? So it's it, which are which is to say, right, an infinite interpersonal God. Um, it's so, so that First Corinthians thirteen twelve sort of thing, right? Know God, uh, or rather, be known by Him. It's the intersubjective knowledge, which, as you say, in a certain from on a certain level, is ineffable in, in like an apophatic thing, but not in the sense of mere removal or negation, but Yes, super an excellence, a sort of mode of, of excellence, but but it's it's actually a, it's actually a proliferation of positivity, if you want to put it that way. It is so fully there, right? In in the moment of love, inter intersubjective love, you know the person. You could never have known them abstractly. You only know them by experience and in love. But you know them. You know them. There's not like a there's not a lack. It's like growing to know them more, it, it expands your ability to know them even as it fulfills it, you know. So it isn't like you you needed something, you sensed it and you moved on. So yeah, anyway, it's this is right. The yeah, I was the kind of, yeah, I was thinking about that along the lines of I had a conversation the other day with, with someone um and I it was it was some Jewish friends and we were we were having a conversation about God's choosing. And it's like I understand you wanting to maintain this idea of God choosing, but whatever God choosing means. It can't mean a choosing between a what what Tomber calls the friction of the yes and the no, right? That's precisely not the kind of choosing right. that 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 God does. If if but if you want to think of God's choosing as a, only the positive, 
as only affirmation, as only the yes, then absolutely God chooses. Right. Yeah. And in, in the right, exactly. And and there is a kind of this is sort of relevant to some some of discussions have been going on recently online, but there's also a kind of um inevitability. And actually, I think I think David does think this. I mean, I think that so David is a moral, his moral genius is incredible. And like it's expansive and it's always so keen. I wouldn't and be I a think, Christian without him. Exactly. And yeah, and I'm I wouldn't be anywhere near where I am God bless him. either. Right. So <laughs> nothing but respect. He's obviously yeah. a million times smarter than I am. He's 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 above me in, a, in many ways. But um but I think and and that moral sense has always been such a like north star, you know, for for I think a lot of us. Um and I think when he's doing that, he is doing actually what what I would want to mean more by the intersubjective, the personal or the or the idealist spirit. I think that's what they mean more than they're giving credit for. But um, but I think it's it's a uh, but it, but it, it, I was talking to somebody the other day. I said said it like this. They're like they're like, well, what about like I mean, what about like if somebody says, well, you know, there's a sort of like like they're trying to conceptualize freedom as as almost total spontaneity, right? Which he's against. David's against, which is which is right. Uh, and like, I mean, there is something, log there's like a, just a sheer logical possibility that me as a free agent, I could stab my eye with a pen, right? Like that's possible. That won't happen, but it is possible. And I, and I said, well, in a certain way it is, but in another way, it's not possible at all. Here's what I mean. E e what we do when we just consider abstract possibilities, like logical possibilities as such, is we subtly, even though we give it a, an appearance, an image, like a concrete instance, we actually replace the, the, the actual person with, with something that, with a person they're not. Mm -hmm. So sure, uh, so one thing is if I stab myself, it might actually be because I'm, I lost my wits and I'm not actually who I am. Mm -hmm. But that would not, but that would mean then that the logical possibility, which seems to be presenting a picture of it, it being possible within the realm of my freedom to stab myself in the eye, is 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 actually not what it's presenting. What it's presenting is the guise of me stabbing myself in the eye. Because when I if I can, quote unquote, can stab myself in the eye, it's only because I ceased to be who I was. So there's a kind of deter there's there's an anchorage in the person there's a determinacy of the person or what i call in the book the positivity mm -hmm. of the person which is a kind of like in love i think we experience this and in beauty we experience this it is a kind of inevitability a determinism in the sense that it's not capricious and right. it's it's utterly intentional right but that's not at all the same thing as a crude sort of determinism on say the materials level or mechanics of things or just an impersonal law unfolding itself. I say all this because the same thing is true of knowledge uh, of God who is infinitely personal, um, of faith, as you say. And I think ultimately it's that positivity of that person, the anchorage of the person, which is in Maximus's view, right, the unity, it's what identifies even his two natures. And ultimately the God world relation itself is identical in him. So that's, that's, those are some just notes on like, that's more what I mean by person than, than just sheer existentialism or something or, right. or voluntarism or kind of unmoored. It, that's just a, another sort of abstraction that person resists actually. True persons are not abstract that way. So um, they're neither they're neither abstractly determinate nor abstractly free, you might say. Um, so anyway, I, I kind of meandered there, but uh, <laughs> back to the book. Uh, so <laughs> so oh, that's fine. <laughs> um, so the book the book begins with. Um, so what's tough about? I was just telling a group of people this morning. I was like, look, what's tough about the book? I do make I do ask a lot of the readers up front. And I do realize this, but but it's the nature of the argument. Because the argument, broadly put, uh, in order to understand and unpack the statement of, uh, that I gave Maximus, um, you know, the word of God, of will is always and all things accomplished, mystery of his incarnation. What I try to do is say, well, what does incarnation really mean? Mm -hmm. That's the starting point. And, and, I, and you have to start at the event of the incarnation. It's not an abstract thing. It's not a propos merely propositional thing. You start with the actuality. This is what makes it more serial of Alexandria. 
you start with the subject, the person, the actor, the one who was born of Mary, the one who, you know, goes forth into the desert, is tempted by Satan, et cetera, et cetera. It's that person you begin with. And, and so I'm asking about that event. What does it mean to call that an incarnation? Is it just the same thing as it is, is, is what we mean by God's general eminence in all things or God's in me and in you or what? Is there something more determinate or specific? So I spin. So what's what's tough about the way the chap the book opens is that the structure of the whole book, the whole, whole argument is that here's what incarnation means, and that's chapter one. And then what I want to say is that the same logic, or what I call Christo logic, in the book that defines, or perhaps better uh, puts in relief, makes plain or lucid for us, that same logic actually goes on in Maximus thought to describe the logic of the entire God world relation, relation of creator and creature. Um, what that means though, is that in the first chapter, you basically get in microcosm form, the entire argument in like 30 pages. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> the, because, because it's the nature of the argument. If I'm right, that creation is incarnation, then understanding the event of the incarnation will be simultaneously to have already kind of run through like an overture of a symphony, mm -hmm. run through all of the themes, which will then again, we recapitulate and we will see play out on the whole level of the God world relation from beginning, that is, you might say the emanation or the creation from nothing, all the way to the end, which is deification of the whole world. And, and then you have to consider the whole and the problems that arise there, which I know we'll talk about later. So, um, so that's that the structure of the argument in, in one way is just very simple. It, it, and if it's, it's that the same exact uh, logic that describes the, the event of the historical incarnation that the, the second person of the Trinity becoming human, that logic also describes the way that the world is created and related to God from beginning to end. And that I, the, also the, could, I also couldn't help but notice that that structure that you present is narrative structure, mm -hmm. which ties it back again to the central the central role that person plays in this in, in, in the in what you're laying out, right? So yeah. it's it's almost like I mean, if let's say had the had the story been um, uh, Adam was created and uh, um, and and incarnated the God world relation perfectly the end. That wouldn't be much of a story, right? For right. for anyone, yeah. So yeah, yes, and it's it's uh and and then what's funny about this story in particular, or I think what's striking maybe or peculiar about it, and this is where like the first chapter is actually the middle. Yes. Then I go second chapter two is the beginning, and then chapter three is the end. Then we have a fourth chapter. Which is the whole kind of simultaneously all at once, right? And what's 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 very bizarre, I think, and mind bending about the incarnation, once you start thinking about its implications, is that if it is the beginning and end of all things, then it will appear to us in the story as a certain episode in the mm -hmm. story, like mm -hmm. a part a part of the narrative unfolding. However, at the same time, it's got to have that. You got to hold that place. Like you need to be able to see, you know, where this fits into this bigger story. But then at the same time, it also is the case that the more you contemplate and meditate upon the central event, the culminating event, the fullness of time, whatever you want to call it, um, it, it, it needs to open up within its very particularity in its position within the story, its episode, episodic position of the story. It needs to open up into, into, to the logic of the whole story itself, the conditions really, as it were, for the possibility of telling the story at all. So it sort of, it opens itself up from within itself. So I think the perfect transition there is now the question that immediately occurs to me is what if scripture itself points toward this? So this this points me toward a remark you made on page 51 of your book, where you refer to the incarnation as the realization of the divine council. Mm -hmm. So ML, ML Bach, in his book on the Apocalypse of John, he reads Revelation chapter four and five as a New Testament creation story. So here we have at the end of the Bible, a story that is calling back to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis. And the script, the, the text 
the text structurally like it self references and tells you when this is happening right because later in the book of revelation it tells you when the lamb was slain, slain before the foundation of the world right. which really reinforces this idea that bach has of tying this and also this just the scene the way the scene lays out it feels like the kind of like the stasis of divine eternity like the images that are presented like are giving you really strong clues that this is that this is something that is like looking into um eternity right yeah so and if you're looking into eternity then it's going to play strange tricks with your notions of time mm -hmm. so it, and it's referencing back to to, to genesis mm -hmm. and it's making a clear reference to the passion so it actually yes. in that those two condensed chapters of the book of revelation it's giving you that whole that whole beginning middle and end right there like that's it in a condensed form yeah which and it's a divine he, council scene <laughs> yeah, exactly it's a divine council scene it's it's like he says this at the end of the book i am the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end yeah and the in the great part and i think well, I, I think i remember because i listened to your discussion about this he points this out in chapter five i mean the scrolls can't be opened by right. anyone Right. Which is, you know, opening of the scrolls or so much of that throughout all of scripture. But it's this sort of it's you get the sense of the the, the beginning and end, the key to the dynamism of history itself and the accomplishing be, of the impossible. Exactly. Well, and that's that's actually a great way to describe which is which nature. reinforces your argument about it not being it not being a likeness of nature. The, and that's the point is that it's it's not that nature is bad or whatever in fact i would argue that like you know nature uh the the intuition of forms the articulation and, and investigation and contemplation of forms or essences of things all that that, that it's all necessary yeah. uh, in terms of the unfolding the progression you need to start somewhere these are the tools within which we begin or with which we begin but just because something is provisionally necessary doesn't mean it's it describes the final necessity of things those are that's not the same thing just because I needed when I was younger certain things in place in order to become mature, well, when I become mature, I no longer need them at all. That doesn't mean I've somehow, it's not an either or, right? It's that I did need them first, I don't need them later. Similarly, we need abstraction, we need philosophical uh, uh, concepts and stuff like this in order to, to begin to grasp certain things. And I'm not you know, aligning with any one particular philosophy, I'm just saying generally, uh, we need logic in that sense. Um, but that, that just because we need it provisionally or as a moment, as it were, of our own sort of coming to be, be, be God uh, and, and his coming to be us, it doesn't mean we need that or that 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 is that acts as a sort of final control over right. what's, what the truth is as right. a whole. That's back to the whole, right. right, the whole mystery of Christ. Right. And so what I love about the Revelation connection that you're making is that's that's the feeling I get as well there in Revelation five is. They're looking around. We're in eternity with the, with the divine council. Who is going to make? Who is going to do, perform, unlock, unravel this impossible possibility? It can't be anyone other than the lame slam before the foundation of the earth, because right. that is the foundation of the earth. And there's another inconceivable thing that happens there too, because in this scene of like stasis of eternity of the divine realm, there's a change. A mm -hmm. change occurs the the lion transforms into the lamb mm -hmm. showing like showing a kind of like change and becoming re rooted in the divine council itself yes which yes. yeah <laughs> that's pretty yeah. mind-blowing yeah it is and it's kind of amazing to see maximus say what he does and from question 60 again he he does equate like you said he calls the incarnation he calls the hypostatic identity of created and uncreated nature in the person of the word he calls that the quote fulfillment of the divine counsel mm -hmm. um it's very amazing in maximus's context to say that because he elsewhere identifies actually in that text too but elsewhere too he identifies the divine counsel with the divine essence mm -hmm. now some people will get worried about that initially right because it's like well so what are you saying god's act of being god necessarily entails or in some sense is perfected in his act of being man being human being the whole world and the answer is yes 
but not the way you think, <laughs> right? <laughs> because, because he does say that he's, he is saying it's a fulfillment, but, but here's, this is something I, I, to me that is an, it's become, I guess it's become more obvious and probably because of Maximus, but we often talk about God's essence as being beyond all essence, mm -hmm. super essential. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about God's, I mean, Maximus talks about God being a uh, truth beyond all truth. That's how I end the book with, with that statement. Yeah. Um, but it's, I think we almost assume that's a negative point, just a regular negative point. Like, well, what he means is like, you know, he's just not like an essence, like a creature is. He doesn't have a beginning in time. He's not finitely bounded or something by these conditions because he is without condition because he's without prior. God is. Well, that's part of it. But I also think the other part is that God's, it's, uh, you might put it this way, and I know it sounds paradoxical, but it's intended. <laughs> it's of God's essence to go out beyond God's essence. Yes. Yeah. Right. This is, this is a, this isn't such a surprising point. I mean, you can find it, right. You can find it. You don't have to go to Dionysius. You can go to the Catechetic Orations of Gregory of Nyssa, who will make the argument that the greatest display of divine power is the incarnation precisely because it's the one place he says you see god going as it were going out of his nature doing something you did not think divinity could do like die mm -hmm. so that surprises you like fire burning downward would surprise you that's acting out of its nature it's an ecstatic movement beyond what you abstractly expected and predicted it would be like and so I think in that way, you know, Mac, of course, Dionysius kind of goes wild with that, with his divine eros and ecstasy. And he says, God is, is a, what is the exact word he used? He says, God is, a, oh, I'm trying to think of the translation of it. It's like he's captivated by our love or something. He's it's almost like God is moved by us to right. and create us. Uh, he uses a strong term that I can't now remember, but Maximus takes that same passage in Ambiguum 71. He's going to he's going to interpret that as the incarnation itself, but not, not just historical, but the whole mystery of Christ, the whole cosmic incarnation. In other words, creation, the act of creation is precisely an act of, of ecstasy on God's part, where ecstasy means going out of his essence, which you you and I have conceived in dis simple distinction from his creation. Like, like, like he's not, not right. He's eternal, not temporal. He's incorporeal, not, not corporeal. He's gone out of his essence in ecstatic, erotic love yeah, for creation. Right, exactly. And as Maximus says, he becomes what he loves. Right. Because that's what Eros does is it seeks to unite. It seeks to unite in the most ineffable, experiential, inter, interpersonal yeah. way. Mm -hmm. And so that, and, and, and that, so, so you can see now what Maximus has done. He's linked two things that are sort of playing with each other, have, hovering in the same orbit, and he's bringing them together definitively. He's saying, we speak, we can, I mean, I'm paraphrasing now, we can speak this way about creation with Dionysius. And then, but then here we are in what we call Christology. Of course, he didn't think of it that way, but the separated domain, like Christology, uh, you know, and he's, in, he's embroiled in these debates, right, with all these different people that I detail in the book. The, the Miaphysites, the Nestorians, and so on. Um, well, it turns out they're the same, they're the same movement, they're the same logic, they're the same problems over and over again. How are you going to how how is it that, you know, like Eric Eugenia brings up later, how how is it that God, who for Eric Eugenia is the nothing out of which everything is created, how does God go out of himself? You know, and he's in Eriugena, following, taking his lead from Dionysius Maximus, will say, well, he does it in his own word. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that the word, as the person, the subject, can take on seemingly, abstractly contrary attributes or, or predicates or realities, really. Like being created. So Eriugena has got this whole long thing in the second division of nature is that in the word, right, in the primordial causes, which are the word, because everything in the word is the word. <laughs> um, God is both creator and created. And that that is the foundation, right? The whole thing is, it, we're using different images to say the same thing. Uh, but I think Maximus is intentionally bringing these together and saying, actually, mm -hmm. this is all, we're describing the same thing, the same dynamic. The ecstasy of God for creation, uh, the incarnation of the word of God within creation, 
um, the, uh, you know, oh, I hit a third image, now I'm starting to lose it. Um, but all of it is, is, is describing the sort of, as you said, I think beautifully, impossible possibility. Right. Yes. So, right. Yeah. That's it. It should it shouldn't it shouldn't surprise us then that to read like say in Plotinus Aeneid's five, where he says, where he's looking at why anything should come forth from the one at all. And he says it doesn't make sense. I don't know why. So what would you say to, what do you would you say to those who say, well, that's just pantheism, so obviously it's wrong. Uh so what I would say is this: if if applying the logic of the incarnation is pantheism, then worshiping Jesus is idolatry. Yeah. So by, by the Jews were right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and, and so it's like by whatever logic you think worshiping a human being whose flesh was created. I mean, that's in the councils, that's in he's he's created, he is created. Cyril of Alexander is that he creates himself. He is he's both, right? Um by whatever logic you think you can worship a man who was born in you know in Nazareth in the first century was a Jewish man, uh, and yet that's not violating the injunction against idolatry. Yeah. Well, then why would why would extending that same logic out to the whole God world relation result in some kind of crude pantheism, which illicitly conflates God and creature? Right. So so that's the big picture. Right. That would be the big sort of retort back is, well, look, tell me why worshiping Jesus is not just uh, idolatrously worshiping a created being, even no matter how high. Uh, and I will then therefore tell you why it is that uh, this isn't just crude pantheism. I prefer something like right. uh, pan Christism or Christism or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that would be a really good short summary of your book. If somebody wanted one or summary, it's all Jesus. It's all Jesus, yeah. <laughs> there's like, there's that, there's that one really funny. I think I talked about it somewhere. The ambiguum where uh, Maximus is discussing the body of Christ, and he's just giving it. I mean, every reference. He's like, the body of Christ is the church, and it is the Eucharist, and it's the whole world, and it's every individual body. And he goes, in truth, it's the body of Christ is all of it collectively and individually all at the same time. It's like, okay. So do whole. you think Maximus would have a problem with uh, stuff like Teilhard de Chardin's idea of, uh, of, you know, the Omega point where essentially the cosmos is becoming Christ? Well, and so, that the Catholic mass actually like plays a role in accomplishing this. Hmm. Okay, so I'll have to be careful because I want to do a better study of Tayar than I have done. I've only read a few of his books and it's been a while. But my hunch is this. Maybe I can back it up and be safe and say it this way. I, I think, you know, I, I, I like the works, for example, of Elia Delio and stuff like that as well. She tries to take up some of Tayard's stuff. However, I mean, to me, this whole, the, we have two one-sided truths that are battling each other you might mm. call one side the classical theist side yep which doesn't like any of this stuff about god you know sort of being in any way identified with history or parts of history or whatever um and so wants to as it were protect god from contamination um on the other hand you have you do have this more process view which has many iterations, one of which might be considered Teilhard's uh, is a version of that or something, even though it's way more scientifically attuned. Um, and that would be that would be the the sort of simple negation or contrary of the class, classical theist view of the God world relation. So the upshot, and I'm going to kind of cheat here and like kick it. Oh you know, no, it's cheating! This you're giving exactly the answer I anticipated. I'm yeah, to hear, so yeah, go good, it. good. Yeah, it's just you know <laughs> skip, skipping over lots of details that that would have to be addressed in a fuller thing, and some of which I think are I do begin to address in, in the fourth chapter with with this idea that how how the world can be both cre create uh, the creation and not yet the creation. But um, I would want to say that the whole truth needs does need to incorporate. What are one sides uh, one side of the truth from either side, classical theist and process, and that simply I do think this kind of perspective, Maximus's kind of perspective, and there are other figures we could maybe think through, think with in the same direction or from the same vantage. If if you're tempted to simply choose a side, you probably are not from their perspective. You're not seeing or even getting close to seeing the whole. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, so so all that saying, the qualification I would want to give prima facie is I think it's no longer responsible to simply write off someone like Teilhard or Elia Delio, whom I've had people I've heard people do do this to her work. Uh, and you know, I'm not sure I'm on board with all of it, but um, it wouldn't be right to simply write it off as if we can continue to speak of God hovering about the the uh, the world after his incarnation into it. And after a sort of the statements of Ephesians and Colossians, which want to expand the scope of God's becoming human, that is to say, creating himself in Jesus of, as Jesus of Nazareth in the womb of the, of the mother of God, expanding the scope of that act to not only the entirety of creation, but as you pointed out earlier, the divine counsel's own fulfillment, being God, means accomplishing this mystery always in all things. If that's all true, then there, we have to find a way, and this is actually a book I'd like to write down the road. I've got plans for it, but I don't know if I'll ever get to it. It's, it's a, the, if that's all true, we have to find a way to incorporate things that seem to be irreconcilable initially. You know, Tomberg, as, as, as you pointed out to me already before, it's really interesting to read him like the meditations of Tara, that, that that letter six that you sent me and that I read through all the way. And I was already reading the, the book, but I hadn't got quite got to there yet. So I skipped to it and read it. Um, you know, that's where he says that's the work of the Antichrist. It's sort of like if you look at Teilhard's book, The Phenomenon of Man, and, and it's like, you know, it's, it's unmistakable that this is sort of the work of an experimenter who's really mm -hmm. wild and crafty and like the serpent. But uh, but is is sort of this, you know, and some people I imagine you probably know more about people's responses to somebody than I do. Some people probably look at that and say, well, that's that's like Gnostic to say that, right? Like whatever that means, like it's a Gnostic because he's denigrating the material creation and and all this. And and that right now, I have to say, I do think that those that work on the question of the like Christian theology and evolution typically want to do something very different, almost the opposite. Yeah, they want to emphasize their sociology through uh, like Celia Dean Drummond or something like her work on um, uh, using Bulgakov and wisdom Christology and stuff. She wants to emphasize, or Sarah Copley or whatever, they want to emphasize the sort of positive elements of that process. But right? Tomberg actually points in those same directions. The cooperation, right? The, yeah. So and, and yeah, it's important to keep in mind when Tomberg was writing, right? So when Tomberg was writing, this kind of like this new like move toward emphasizing the cooperative and evolution wasn't a thing. Right. But right. he actually anticipates. He actually right, anticipates right. it becoming a thing because he says that that's a real principle. And that's actually the creation yeah. that that is the creation as God intended it, which, of course, this links us to Maximus, because I think it's possible within Maximus's framework to kind of say Tomberg might be onto something a little bit here, because for Maximus, like Adam's fall happens simultaneously with his coming into being. Yes. So to see all of history up to this point you know, or up to a certain point as a product of the fall is a completely viable thing. Now, obviously, the incarnation being both in the beginning, middle and end, it is it's one of those things where it's it's always already. Yeah. And not yet. Right. At the same time. So and, and it's already and not yet, not just not just sequentially. It's already already and not yet in every moment of the sequence. Right, exactly. Because because yes. he because he wants to he wants to actualize the mystery of his incarnation always and in all things. Right. Well, surely there are things in the past that it has not yet actualized into it. Because look at it, it's tragic. Right. In Tomberg's book, ultimately, it's a wisdom book for the initiate and the hermeticist. So what he's right. really wanting, what Tomberg's hoping to accomplish, is to get you to stop seeing the world in terms of the struggle for existence, because seeing the world in that way will lead you into the mentality of the serpent and the mentality of the anti Antichrist and make it harder for the, the real work of life to happen in you. Yeah, you know, and now that you're saying that, it does recall, he actually even in here has this passage, like the, it's like the uh, page before one of the ones you sent me now, I'm trying to find it, I should have bookmarked it. Uh, it's a real, yeah, here we go. On page 140, he says, this is really striking. And I do think this really resonates with the Maximian framework. He says, vertical Trinitarian grace and the triadic spirit of horizontal evolution met, therefore, in the consciousness of the son of man. 
right. 40 days after the baptism of the Jordan. And then he goes into the temptation stuff. Um, that's a remarkable statement because, because there he is getting at, you know, this vertical non-rivalrous, right, sort of disposition towards the world and cooperative, who might call it love of neighbor and, and God, mm -hmm. um, or an enemy even. This, he's saying that vertical grace met. Yeah, exactly. We might, and he, we he might has say, a diagram. He has yeah. a diagram. He says, <laughs> and he says, this is why it's a cross. Exactly. Because it's the intersection of the vertical and the horizontal. And, and what does Maximus end up saying? right about the passion as he calls it the judgment yeah but he does it with an origin a sense of judgment i go into detail in, in the fourth chapter of the book but the, the the big the short of it is this uh maximus knows the tradition from or actually starts at the origin of agris didn't miss the point and it, and, and it became by his time it was a sort of quick way to reference the whole god world relation like the metaphysics of all creation judgment and providence judgment according to the kind of simple narrative you know people debate about whether or not origin held it he probably didn't whatever let's just say though that the simple popular level version of this originist story or myth was you know there was this primordial unity of all intellects with god uh, they all fell except one that'll be jesus later uh, but they all fell and as they're following god effects a judgment judgment in greek is diakrisis or crisis division and so the judgment is God's creation in response, as it were, to the to the fall, the primord of the primordial unity. He creates the world, the, the multifarious, manifold world of materiality and corporeality, all these different bodies, the hierarchy, hierarchically arranged essences, et cetera, et cetera. He creates it all to catch the falling souls mm -hmm. as they cool off in love from God. And, and they catch and they're caught in this life. And that's what you're born into. And then uh but he doesn't just judge just as a reaction like oh i'm mad at you for follow you know for it, the judgment is already circumscribed in the greater purpose of providence mm -hmm. providence is reunification or apocatastasis or however you want to put it it's restoration to that primordial unity with god right. now that's all fine and, and maximus has his critiques of that and so on and pre-existence of souls it became a you know a pretty big huge point of contention and he doesn't simply hold to the simple narrative, but he doesn't simply abandon those concepts either. He reapplies them, reconceptualizes them. And he does so. No, I would actually argue that like reincarnation as Tom Bird conceives it is actually compatible with what you've presented in your book. So that's something I, yes, yeah, you know him better. <laughs> I would like to hear that, but yeah, it's, <laughs> but, but the, so what Maximus does runs it through the actual event of the historical incarnation and he says that providence is the incarnation itself like the conception mm -hmm. of the word of god in mary and then the, the like the Irenaean sort of recapitulation or unification of god and humanity through every stage of humanity that whole thing the unification the process of unification is providence right it's the providencia it's the thing god again conceived before he saw beforehand the vision beforehand it's that for which all things were made that's providence that's the incarnation always and in all things right but judgment rather than being a response is actually he says the passion of christ the cross mm. now i get into a detail there we don't have to go far into that here but but the the, the main point would be this the cross in in the cross it's not just that christ suffers it's that he suffers the suffering of the entire world right and that and his suffering it because when he what god experiences is is experiencing it and it being there to be experienced are one and the same when he experiences suffering death right mm -hmm. he became sin and a curse for us as paul says he not because he deserved it some personal guilt thing he's sinless but he experienced the consequences of sin so that the consequences of sin could become the conditions for the possibility of us choosing the way of sin, not because sin's good or we should choose it or, or because our true freedom is oriented towards it, but because we are created in a state of immaturity, as Irenaeus says, we have to grow into freedom mm -hmm. as spirit. And so that's a complicated, weird, mind-bending picture. But the big upshot I wanted to, to bring here was... Um, to identify the judgment of God with the passion of Christ is the same thing as saying that in the passion of Christ, God in principle, that is in potency, 
creates the possibility, in other words, of not just all of the essences and things and the kinds and genera of things he makes and species, but of all individuals in the sum total of their free determinant acts, no matter what it takes, what winding roads they have to go to in order to return back to him in providential right, union. And so that's crazy. I mean, that's weird. And there's a lot of stuff there to think through. But um, yeah, one of the that, things that occurred to me as you were speaking is like, you can kind of see this judge, this act of judgment as, as saying, this is the story. Yeah. Which yep. ties it back to the way you, it, it, which again, ties it back to the structure of your book and, 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 the, and, and the, the entire structure of the pattern. Like and, this and is the story. So like, this is now, this is, this is, so what's being judged is history, right? And yes, now this is, right. so now this is, this is history at, at, as I choose to judge it. Like this, this is the, this is what becomes history now. Right. And in this strange way, what happens there in the middle is, is, is retroactively the condition for the possibility of the entire story that preceded right. the, the historical yeah. incarnation, because yeah. the effect of the, it, this is the big, this is a big principle or a big picture thing. The effect of the incarnation cannot be limited to the time period of the incarnation. Right. Because it's the, it's the unification of time right. and eternity. Right. Right. In himself, exactly he transcends. Right. right. That's also why, as he, as Maximus discusses, like you could, we, we've, we've been doing it here in the negative side, right? But mm -hmm. the fall at the beginning of existence, right? In the moment, it could, but you could do it positively. The reason why Melchizedek could be deified hundreds of years before Christ, even though his deification is a result or a consequence of what Christ did here in history, right. is because what he did here is not confined there. And we believe that about a lot of things, right? We all mm -hmm. believe that in some way or another about say grace or uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, salvation itself. So, so that, that kind of, you know, what, what they talk, Gregory of Nyssa, they talk about his view of this kind of stuff as reciprocal causality mm -hmm. across time. It's sort of, it's in the sequence and you discern in the sequence, but it's not limited or confined to the sequence in terms of what affects what. That kind of- Yeah, it's like you mentioned Jensen earlier. Jensen has that line that, that, that uh, Christ, uh, time is a double helix with Christ in its center. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, lo <laughs> I, lo I love that, you know, despite some, some people's worries about that. I love that. And so, yeah, anyway, that's the kind of, that would be the sort of framework within which, this is a long, I know it's long-winded, but that's the, that's the framework within which I would want to assess and maybe in some ways reassess, like say the question, of how you evaluate uh, creation through natural evolution. Right. Is it simply good? Is it simply bad? Is there a good and bad necessity to progression and evolution itself? Can we emphasize the good cooperative elements as Tom Berg and now other theologians do? Which I think well, it recognizes better. our role in it. Exactly. Like it's, yes. we're, we're, right. it's we're no longer out of the, it's no longer something that just happens to us. Right. Right. It becomes something that we're a part of. Mm -hmm. And so that makes all the difference in the world. And, and I don't where, think, and that that possibility is necessarily grounded in Christ, in my opinion. Yes, and it also leads to this, and I try to emphasize a little bit in the last chapter. It's, I think, one thing I really learned from thinking through Maximus and with Maximus, and as I still read them, you, I think, we very quickly forget that the project of creation is like the terminus or the perfection of it. Its completion is in like faces. Mm -hmm. not ideas exactly not ideas right right which which means the way in which it phenomenologically appears or sequentially we might even say this one historically appears to us to unfold is never separate from his will to incarnate in all things and all times always in all things and yet that is no mechanical process it nope. must come through the cooperation of spirit which is always inherently free and assenting and rational and has to be wooed by love there's no other way mm -hmm. and so if that's the if that's the character of this project called creation rather than oh creation is like god setting the stage and then history is like the drama unfolding and that goes bad and then and then christology and soteriology is like Christ coming down and fixing the drama or in this sort of climactic moment and then eschat the church and then to eschatology is like the denouement and Right. That's a simple, that's, I get, I get that's where we have to start in a lot of ways, but like when we're, if we're going to think about it seriously and the deeper you think about it through the incarnation and that being the ground and goal of all things, 
and incarnation into it. Another, another way to put this, by the way, is incorporation of actual spirits into the body of Christ right? as his members, which is another New Testament way to talk about all this, um, which isn't mechanical. It isn't impersonal. It's actually the high, it's actually the, the it's actually the attempt to birth persons. That's actually the goal. Right. And right. perfect, right? And to met into the full maturity of Christ, the fullness of Christ, as it as it says uh, in Philippians. So, like, if that's the goal, God is not bound to do the process in any other way except to achieve the goal. Right. So space-time is not some absolute constraint on God. The only thing that's a constraint on God, and here I learned this from George MacDonald, the only thing that's a constraint, so to speak, which is a wrong way to say it, the only thing that is a control in God's process of creation is, is his goal of making creation his sons and daughters, mm -hmm. his adoption. Anything else is fair game. It's all fantasy right. in that sense, and in mm -hmm. the deeper sense, right? Right, right. So yeah, absolutely. I've always, I always loved that line in the fantastic imagination where he says, basically, there are no rules in writing fantasy, except you never make good evil or good and evil into good. In other words, morality, the, the, let's just say the character of God, the infinite character of God is love is the only constant. Mm -hmm. If God has to mess with time and space and what we consider the inviolable laws of this or that, you know, of physics, or to set them up a certain way, or to have them transcend themselves at a certain stage, or whatever he has to do to get to you. Right. He will do it. Right. There's no there's nothing else holding the holding them back. Right. So that's 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 something I really that allowed me to kind of like suspend the uh, quote unquote commonsensical notions of what creation must mean. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wow. That that was fantastic. Thank you, thank you, Jordan. <laughs> thank you, Jordan. This thank was a, you. This was a delightful conversation. I I hope you, I hope to have you on again um, at some point. Um, yeah. I'm. Uh, do, are you familiar with the work of uh, John Dravicki, the cognitive scientist? Uh, you know, you're like the third person that's asked me, and the answer okay. is still sadly no. But okay. uh, it's okay. interesting that he keeps getting brought up. But yeah. Well, he's a, he, he's an interesting character because he's a cognitive scientist, but he's also he's also a neoplatonist. So I was thinking I, I would really like to get you guys together to have a conversation. And he reads Maximus too. So I would oh, really cool. like to I would really like to get you guys together to have a conversation about participation. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so and I know he's read part of your book because I know like he sent me an email like after he first started reading it and he was like, Pearl, yes, exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> when he first started reading your book. So, a, a few pages later he's like oh no it's gone downhill. no i love yeah. pearl that's my yeah I love yeah pearl. so yeah. i think you guys could have a really good conversation and he's been actually he's been he, and the other reason i want to have you talk to him is like he keeps asking these really complicated questions about hypothesis oh okay, to people really? who have no idea what he's asking or how to answer him you know so, that's not a common thing i hear right so <laughs> Yeah. this cognitive scientist is really interested in hypothesis yeah oh yeah he keeps like he sees that as like well he's like he has this sort of like uh i think he calls himself a non-theist right so he doesn't he won't call himself an atheist yeah um but he's like very insistent on god's no thingness but he still has a curiosity about the christian insistence that in some ways god is hypostatic and he yeah. asked very intelligent questions about that that I haven't seen anyone give him a good answer to. So, oh, interesting. That might be. Oh, that's that's fascinating. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah. yeah. So I'll see if I can set that up, and I'll be in touch. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. it thank you, Nate. Yeah. Thank you very much.